I imagine uh, most of you, if not all of you, recognize this brand. And when people think about this brand and the, some of what it is, but it's cars and automotive and innovation and opportunities and access. Um, but a lot of times people talk uh, bad, uh, bad press and uh, poor management. Uh, and as of yesterday, some pretty significant layoffs. So, you know, I think there's a, some perceptions about, well, about who and what this company is. There's also an organization that's doing very similar work with transportation, ease of access. But I've often heard it's sometimes more convenient. Sometimes I've heard it's less expensive. Uh, I've heard oftentimes it might have a, uh, a better brand reputation. Um, and I imagine all of you, if you have a preference, have a preference for one or the other. I think the same might be true of this. I imagine most of you, if not all of you, recognize this brand. And I think most often when I bring this up, people talk about German and engineering and performance. I've also heard this brand described as my parents' car, which I thought was, I thought was fantastic. Conversely, a similar automobile, similar role, but I've heard um, performance, uh, engineering, uh, the ultimate driving machine. So this is not an exercise in brand awareness and analysis, but for all of us, we each have an understanding of, of who these organizations are, and we have an understanding of what they do and the preferences for how we want to engage them and what we think about them. The exact same process that we use to discern between two brands in the same category is exactly the same process an organization uses to discern between two viable candidates for the same job. So from a career planning and strategy standpoint in the Tufts Career Services, what we're trying to help our students and alumni do is how can we help you become the preferred candidate for all the jobs that you approach and apply for in the future? We're not exclusively brands. We are complex individuals with a lot of different backgrounds and experiences. But I think thinking in terms of this allows us to think outside of vocation, outside of job title, and thinking more along about what jobs tend to be is, why are you valuable? Why are you interesting? And why should we hire you? Because a role is if an organization finds you valuable, and likes you and is willing to pay you, that is a job. So this is a conversation around thinking about the, the scope of the roles we're looking for and then how to go after them and build the relationships um, to best navigate a job search strategy. This is probably, I think it's one of the most important slides and concepts in career planning is that career planning is a process. I think for many of us who maybe historically have worked with career services or tried to navigate their careers is oftentimes using that resource for resumes and cover letters and interview preparation. And those things can be incredibly helpful, but we want to make sure realize is that, is that career planning falls on a, a career planning strategy falls along a trajectory is that most of the time when people are thinking about building their brands and, and, looking for opportunities and working for your services, they're thinking about their, their documents. But in order to manage an effective job search and networking strategy, it's making sure that you have enough information to make sure that you have targeted the appropriate roles that you're looking for. What we're trying to prevent is taking a very wide and broad approach to job search strategy because it oftentimes is less effective than one that's focused. So sending multiple resumes out to multiple organizations about multiple roles with multiple skill sets, oftentimes dilutes the messaging to the organization where they're more opt to follow and target and uh, pursue a candidate that's directly focusing on the roles that, they're, that they are hiring for. So when we're thinking about job search strategy and for today, it's certainly making sure, and I know this is a question that had, had, uh, had come up earlier um, to be able to talk about, is you know, how we apply to these opportunities, is thinking about what your, 
what you're focusing on. And that becomes critical because it's, once you know what that is, once you have job titles and they, you can have multiple targets, but when you have the spe those specific targets, the language you use, the focus you use, how you define your search strategy becomes critical. Because once you have your targets, because different employers, different hiring managers, and different recruiters use different job search strategies to find talent. So I imagine many of you have, if not all of you, have looked for and applied for jobs or internships online. Most people use big, giant job aggregators to look for jobs. When I speak to those monster career builder, Indeed, ZipRecruiter. These are large, very large uh, job search sites that are aggregating multiple roles across the internet into one site that are easily accessible. The reason they're used the most often is that they come up most likely, most often come up at the top of search results when you're looking for jobs. So you'll see these, and the reason for that is because they're large and they have lots of resources and they're heavily embedded in SEO within your job search profiles, which is fantastic. But the thing with this is that most people are spending most of their time looking for opportunities on big aggregated job boards. We believe 20% of all jobs in the marketplace get to an aggregated job board. So what that means is that most people are spending most of their time competing for one in five jobs. But we wanna help our students think about or where are the other 80%? This is a framework about where and how you can look for job opportunities and internship opportunities. Every organization uses different tools and resources to find the talent that they're looking for. Recruiters and hiring managers for a healthcare consulting role may use five different tactics then we use five tactics that are five separate tactics that when somebody from an art director job for a museum would look for. So what we wanna make sure is that when you have a focused approach and have a, the jobs that you're looking for, then we can talk about how those organizations are looking for you. So beyond the job boards, I'd like to go through a, a few of these so far. One of the things is looking for company websites. And this is true because there are many organizations that do not have the time, the resources, or the bandwidth to promote their job and internship opportunities outside of their own websites or from word of mouth. So what this means is that if it requires individuals to make sure when they're looking at job opportunities is that they understand the markets and the industries in which they're looking. So if you're looking at healthcare or biotech or education or consulting is thinking about how broadly those organizations are and what they specifically do. Because what we're finding is that if, if not casting a wide net or not digging into the sort of the smaller and mid-sized organizations, you're going to be competing against the companies that come up on top of the search results again. But because most organizations are small and mid-sized, most of you will end up working for those types of organizations. So making sure that you know all the all those organizations within the space becomes really, 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 excuse me, really uh, critical. I imagine all of us have or are aware of LinkedIn as a resource. We are huge advocates for LinkedIn as a as a job search and a networking tool. There are 700 million people on LinkedIn and 665 million jobs and internships. It is a massive resource. It is, we consider the social currency of, of business and, and professional connections right now. It is an amazing resource for finding opportunities, finding people and making connections. It is also the preferred resource for hiring managers and recruiters for sourcing, evaluating and hiring talent. From a job search perspective, it is also, it has, just to be reminded that it, it's expensive to promote a job and an internship on LinkedIn. For a lot of these roles, it's $500 per month per job or per internship. 
lots of organizations do not have the resources to promote their roles. So what this is saying is if you're using LinkedIn as, as your ex exclusive way of searching for opportunities, even though it is an excellent one, you are limiting your opportunities that are, that are currently present in the marketplace. Now I bring up, next one is, is social media, one we don't often think about. Companies have been trying to figure out how to leverage social media as a platform for finding talent for a long time. Um, Facebook has gone through three different businesses and business models to be able to for job search strategy um, that have not landed so far. But companies, certainly in a booming market, are trying to find all vehicles to make sure their brand is, people are aware of it in the marketplace. So recognizing that companies will use Instagram, they will use Twitter under certain circumstances, many times to promote their businesses, and in some circumstances, be able to promote their jobs. So for instance, if you went to uh, Twitter and looked at uh, finance jobs, Boston, you will see a list of opportunities that come up. They may not be relevant. They may not be current, but to recognize that that is another medium that organizations might be using to search for talent can be helpful. The next thing is communities. And when I think of communities, I think about the, 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 the groups of people that with shared interests in our lives. They could be classmates, schoolmates, professors, um, faith-based groups, sports organizations, et cetera. This is really interesting to me, having been a coach for the last 10 years, is that what we end up finding is the people who are oftentimes our biggest advocates for the work that we do and biggest advocates for our professional and personal success are oftentimes the ones that know the least about us and what we're trying to do. So asking yourself, you know, would my family and friends do they understand what I do? Do they have my marketing documents? And would they be able to share my information and what I do to somebody in their own network? This is all predicated on your own comfort level about sharing your information, your insights, and your expectations for the communities with you. Technology is an amazing way to find opportunities. You are 10 times more likely to secure an opportunity, secure a job, secure uh, an internship through a relationship. So we wanna make sure that people recognize is that using both tools and resources is an excellent way to make this happen. So making sure that your network is aware of who you are and what you can do so they can share. And think about it as a, as a, as a, <clears throat> a tool in efficiency is that oftentimes it can be helpful to have 10 people working on your behalf than just working on your own. So this is where I'll speak to the next categories where recruiters and placement agencies. I think there's some, can be some misconception about what those organizations do and who they are. I think the term headhunter comes up often and there's some sort of negative connotations with they're just trying to find people and plug them into jobs that might be great, not great fits just to get paid. Um, in my experience and having been an executive recruiter, um, I can tell you that I, I find it to be the opposite, is that recruiters tend to be professionals who are working on behalf of companies who are paying them to find the right talent for their organizations. So working with recruiters who are sourcing the types of jobs that you are looking for, having four or five organizations and people looking on your behalf is a casts a wider net and makes potentially provides more options and opportunities for you um, to explore and apply for and um, hopefully uh, secure. Placement agencies I would consider are recruiters. The difference typically is that they have a, a larger portfolio of organizations that they work for and they hire for a variety of jobs. So not just full-time opportunities, temporary, temporary to permanent, contract. So what they're doing is companies that may have specific needs that may be short-term, that may be focused in a specific area. What placement agencies allow us to do and are a huge resource, particularly in this type of marketplace, when 
opportunities are thinning faster than, than we'd certainly like to. There are definitely companies that are looking for specific, specific talent and expertise. These are the types of organizations that you can apply for. They'll evaluate, evaluate your skill sets and will place you in roles. Now, depending on your needs as a professional, sometimes you, know, you have the opportunity to look for the, the best opportunity. Where placement agencies can be a great resource if you need an opportunity now. So for many of us, you know, who are, have or, or are in the process of graduating or close, <clears throat> we're needing an income stream. A placement agency is a place that you can share. And at, after this conversation is over today, um, I'll be sharing with everyone a, a directory of organizations, including placement agencies, that uh, by topic area that you can use to search. So we have about 15 uh, placement agencies in Boston area. Most of them are national, but have offices in Boston that you could use. So be able to provide you some tools. So ultimately, this is just a way to work with organizations that are working on your behalf to give you uh, a broader scale of finding roles. Next one I'll sort of speak to is, you know, there's a lot of pieces is alumni networks. And I think, you know, we'll talk about networking strategy is that recognize that there's a hundred, over 100,000 uh, Tufts alumni and about 70,000 plus on LinkedIn. But the idea is how do we, how do we leverage those folks? Is that, you know, the one great thing about <clears throat> being a Tufts graduate or a Tufts student is that you have something um, in common with 100,000 other people. So being able to think and leveraging a, a common relationship to find a role becomes a huge deal. And we'll certainly talk about how to build those connections. But it's recognizing that all the alumni works, the networks that you're connected with can be very helpful to be able to access. One resource that has been uh, excellent, it's something that's brand new, is that we've created something called Jumbos to Jumbos, or Jumbos for Jumbos. The employer relations team for uh, at Tufts Career Center has been working with um, working with our alumni population to create uh, short, medium, and long-term projects and job opportunities exclusively for Tufts students and alumni. With the idea in mind is that because there's so much change in the market, because job and internship opportunities are being postponed or eliminated, how do we find opportunities to build skill sets and credibility and get paid ideally? Um, potentially in the short term. So one of the resources that we have, and I imagine many of you have used, is Handshake. Um, Handshake has tens of thousands of employers and tens of thousands of jobs for our Tufts community. The one thing that's great about Handshake is that employers have to opt into our platform. So the roles that are present on, on Handshake, the job opportunities and internship opportunities, um, et cetera, are from companies and organizations that are looking for Tufts talent. They are also posting these opportunities at other schools, but they have to ask to be part of that network. So it's one, it's one less filter to have to search for an opportunity. Within Handshake looking for job opportunities, you can look for jumbos to jumbo, jumbos for jumbos with a number four and search for lists of opportunities that you might be looking for in the coming months. We're adding to them daily. Um, and we, it is wonderful to see that the expectation that the Tufts alumni were, were, benefic were um, benefactors of, and of our students and alumni, and we're seeing that they very much want to support our, our opportunities and, and making sure people are able to navigate this uh, somewhat untenable time. The next one I'll mention, and I think this is particularly important for graduate students, is uh, professional associations. From a hiring perspective, especially for recruiters and hiring managers, we definitely look for professionals who are affiliated with professional associations. So if you are an engineering student, you know, the IEEE, or if you are the American Marketing Association, the American Heart Association, the American uh, Institute of X, Y, and Z. So these are places where like-minded professionals with, with uh, complementary skill sets are connecting about topics within their industry. It is a very easy place for recruiters to find that level of talent. Many, many of these 
of uh, professional associations have are free or highly discounted to current students uh, and recent alumni. It's many, many of them have um, elaborate uh, job, job search and mentoring uh, programs within their associations. So we are advocates for using all of the resources you have available to you. So you may very well be able to find roles and opportunities on job boards within these organizations. <clears throat> but if not, it's a place to network and build relationships with people with, with, a similar, um, with similar backgrounds. So you can go to the American Marketing Association for Boston right now, and there are dozens and dozens of jobs across disciplines and, and that you can access right now. There's something on here, especially for if you're in Massachusetts. Uh, again, I mentioned thinking about all the resources that are available to you. I'd be using Tufts Career Centers, one using you know, faculty and administrators, you know, in their relationships, using your undergraduate uh, career services if they have those things. In Massachusetts, they have state career centers, so it's another. I believe it's a free resource where they have listed jobs, job training, job opportunity development within the organization and. They have, you know, if in a non socially distanced universe, there are places you can go, they're brick and mortar organizations or facilities, but you can certainly go to these online to find other roles. But the whole idea is just making sure you have as broad a, a, a reach and perspective in the roles and opportunities. The last piece on this list that I'll mention is the very bottom, the bottom. Uh, it says create your own opportunity. And this is becoming very common. It is entirely possible, if not likely, is that the roles that you are the most qualified for or will be the most qualified for do not exist yet. The speed of change in technology and services and options is changing so rapidly is that the value that we are able to create is shifting, is shifting quickly. So the idea is that organizations are trying to catch up to what students are learning in the classroom but this is where you know the career center i think can be very is helpful it's helping you think about what your targets are and if you are trying to figure out what you are looking for and what you're trying to target what you're trying to focus on is helping you on inventory what your skills are what your competencies are what your interests are uh, what your work styles are and to think about how those things can be applied in the marketplace so the idea is that if you are trying, if you're still in the exploration phase, is that, you know, making sure you understand yourselves, you know, categorically, but also because we spend a lot of time working with uh, organizations and employers to understand their needs and their expectations, but we also do a lot of market research and due diligence about what's happening in trends. So what, you know, how, what is a post-COVID world going to look like? How can you leverage your skills in those spaces? How could you add value in those times? So if you are wondering if your existing skill set is marketable, I can assure you that it is. If it's finding it more difficult to, to find that particular target in your career, that's what the career services team um, is here to help you do, is to get you to that place. So I think it's, it's just helpful to recognize that Whatever you're searching for, whatever you're focusing on, it is likely that you will have a, a, a coordinated search. You may be using one, two, four, five, six of these different pieces to put those things together. The career services team can also help you figure out how to prioritize what to focus on, on given what we know to be the behavior of people finding those types of roles. I think that can be helpful. So to make sure is that we do not expect you to be experts on the career planning, the career planning process. You know, these are all skills that are, that, are, that we've all developed over time. What we hope you to be is to be experts in the things that you love and enjoy and want to do and to give you the tools and the resources um, on your terms to make sure that you can, that you can execute on what you're trying to do. As I mentioned a little before is that we have a directory of targeted job boards. So I'd mentioned that the 20% with the big aggregators, these are the aggregators I'm speaking to. So these are, these are huge organizations. They are valuable. 
they are excellent ways to see the types of the variety and types of roles that are currently being hired for or have historically been hired for. The challenge with aggregators is they're not necessarily well moderated. So you might see the ideal job, but the ideal job that you're seeing is two years old and it was hired for <laughs> years ago. So I think it's a great place for, for information. That being said, posting your resume to these job boards, um, these, a few of them, is a good idea. We know that hiring managers and recruiters and placement agencies um, are placing opportunities in these places and are also searching these aggregators for, for, for the talent that they're looking for. So having an up-to-date document or up-to-date documents on these places allows for passive search, allows other people to find you without you having to be actively promoting your brand all the time. Here's the list of placement agencies and temporary staffing agencies that I had mentioned. Everything in this document is hyperlinked. So there's about 20 different categories. Um, we have healthcare, biotech, life sciences, logistics, sustainability, uh, arts and sciences, and marketing, uh, strategy, consulting, et cetera. So what we've done is we've aggregated, we've created a document that has spe market specific targeted job boards that you can use to look for opportunities. For those of you who know exactly what you want that are great, even for those of you who are just exploring opportunities, going to targeted sites to see what's happening within those particular segments. Um, our, whole, our goal was to create something that just to save you time. Now for many of you thinking about your job search and realizing that um, it may be frustrating or less fruitful than you wanted to be, maybe you had a job and it's on hiatus or it's left or it's same thing for an internship, it is most likely that you already have a set of skills and competencies that people will pay you for. What we wanna be able to do is, is, if you're thinking about that in the shorter term, is how do we monetize your skill set? This is a, um, a sampling of organizations that are looking for contractors and freelance professionals and search or providing short term work. So these can be very helpful resources in a market like this where finding the full, a full time role can be difficult. So there's a right. So in some of cases, there are like something like in. Uh, LinkedIn profiler, where you can create a profile, showcase your expertise and set a rate and people can hire you. Other of these roles are actually positions that currently exist and you can, that you can apply for that might be short term or contract um, and oftentimes you know, can be renewed. This is not something to have to figure out all in one place. We just want this conversation is just to make you aware of the variety of options that are available to you. So depending on your current circumstances and certain timing that there are, there are tools and resources that we use to, to navigate um, uh, this somewhat unusual time. We are excited about the possibilities um, just from a, from a job search. We don't know what the marketplace is going to look like, but we do know that companies and organizations are still hiring. We are aggregating job boards and job listings daily. Um, and it's something I can certainly send out after this message as well is online directories of companies and organizations that are currently hiring, which can be helpful. So making sure that you, and the Tufts Career Center webpage um, will have those, uh, should have those resources as well. So that's job and internships search strategy and where and how to look. So I think oftentimes people ask, you know, if the networking and relationship management piece is such a critical part of career planning, how do I navigate that? So I wanna be able to, to provide an example of possibilities. So this is, a map, a visual map of my LinkedIn connections. Uh, this was about seven or eight years ago. So every dot in this picture represents an individual contact in, in my LinkedIn directory. And the colors are clusters of the communities in those spaces. 
Unfortunately, this tool no longer exists. Um, I found it a very useful way of visualizing how our networks and communities are engaged and what the possibilities are and who we already know. So this just happens to be a, a cluster of um, where I did my graduate work at uh, in business school. So it just it's one example of a cluster. But here's the thing with LinkedIn is that this represents about a thousand connections. So that's me being directly connected to a thousand individuals. But if I want to talk to somebody who knows somebody else, a secondary connection, you know, under these, you know, in these contexts within LinkedIn, that gives me access to about a half a million people. If I was two degrees away from somebody, so I had to go through two people to get to the third person I want to talk to, I had access to about 11 million people. Now these numbers I suspect um, have doubled um, since seven or eight years ago. And the total LinkedIn contacts at the time was about 250,000 right now, like I mentioned, it's about 700 million, or sorry, 200 million to 700 million. Recognizing the staggering access we have to a global network of people with a resource that is predominantly free. Now, there are a few limitations to LinkedIn. One of the questions I often get asked is, you know, how do I, how do I reach out to a second degree connection and have a conversation? What used to be a free service is that you used to be able to ask for a, a connection request. This option is now a paid option. So for, for LinkedIn, job search will allow you to do this. But what it allows you to do is, is if you were trying to reach a second degree connection, you could ask a first degree connection connected to that second degree connection for an introduction to you. That's where I think people, you know, is it, is it valuable to pay for LinkedIn as a service per month? Um, we can talk about you know, the conditions where that can be helpful. That is a circumstance where that can be helpful. The alternative to doing that is using your in-mails. And typically with a free version, you have five. An in-mail is, it allows you to send a direct message to a non-first degree connection without having a connection or relationship with them first. I believe as if you pay for the pay version, it goes to 20 or 25 in-mails. So what this allows you to do is to find anybody on LinkedIn and, and reach out to them directly and connect with them, which can be very, very helpful not only for, you know, for exploring opportunities, but, um, you know, uh, finding and talking about roles. Now, the one thing that I want to mention about networking, and this is another question that came up, somebody had asked about, you know, I, if you have tendencies toward introversion, um, how do I navigate a, a networking world? Whatever your preferred style is, However you like to engage individuals and groups at your most specific comfort level is the right networking strategy for you. There is no <clears throat> singular way to build and connect, build relationships and connect with people. One of my close friends is a serial entrepreneur who happens to be, um, he considers himself to be quite introverted. And it's not that he's shy, it's that, is that large social interactions are exhausting. And I think that's true for a lot of us. Not everybody wants to walk into a room of a thousand people with a stack of business cards and shake a lot of hands and have a lot of conversations. Some of us like one-on-one, some of us like small groups, some of us like face-to-face, -face, some of us like technology. All of those things are fine. In my, in my colleague's particular case, is that in order for him to generate business, he was running his business, is that in biotech, he would, every year in Boston, there's an event called bio where thousands and thousands of biotech professionals get together. And what he would do is he'd register for the event and get a list of the participants who were going there. He would look at his own business, what value that he can create and look at the types of people that were participating and see and build a strategy of how he thought he could help them. And then what he'd do is he'd go to the events and these you know, big giant rooms, and he would find his one or two people that he wanted to talk to over the course of the week, and he'd wait, and he'd wait, and he'd wait, and he'd wait, and he'd wait until he had an opportunity to have a conversation. 
he would introduce himself, talk about value, take somebody out for lunch, um, and that turned into a series of business strategies, and he's never submitted a resume in the 20 years that I've known him. That same process and philosophy can be used in career planning and strategy, is the idea is that you can focus on one or two individuals that work best for you, have an, you know, an interest in, in what you have or want to learn about them. And you know, from a networking perspective, there's a lot of different ways to think about it. For some of you are still trying to explore and don't necessarily know what you want to do, the idea is, how do I learn from somebody else about their background and experience and how do they want to talk to me? One thing that we, we have found in career services, and I would say this is particularly uh, true in the Northeast, is that for many people, their profession defines who they are and what's most important to them. And what we also find is people love to talk about the things that they do and what they're good at. So when you think about networking for relationships and for information, recognizing the fact that you asking somebody else about what they've cultivated and developed is, can be uncomfortable, but oftentimes is actually very much appreciated by the person you're reaching out to. Now, from a networking perspective, is being intentional about those conversations that you're having is really important. Is that if you were looking for information from somebody about their experience or the industries that they've worked in, I wanted to know them, is the idea is that when you are building a relationship, it is not about you. It is about the other person. So if you're, because what you're trying to do is build a common connection and share information. So in time, could be short term or long term, is that both of you can leverage that relationship for, for opportunities, ideally in the future. One of the things as we're exploring new career roles is the, you know, <clears throat> the agenda list meeting or the informational interview, where this is a way to, this is just having a conversation with a stranger in an, in an, in an area of interest that might be, uh, a, a, an area that's of interest to you. It doesn't have to have any constraints or boundaries, but what I would think about when you're networking, building a relationship, is doing research ahead of time to be very understanding of the people you are trying to talk to and what their experiences are. LinkedIn's a very good way to sort of see what their, they've articulated what their background is. Be very specific about what you're looking for for them and make it easy for them to want to have a conversation with you. Um, after this slide, there's a, an ex a sample template of how to do an outreach message a cold one to a potential contact. So somebody you don't know before, how do you, would you reach out to them for a conversation? There's a variety of ways to do that. But I think you want to be able to make sure is why you're interested in talking to them, specifically, if possible, what you're looking for, and how can you make it easy for them to want to reach out and connect with you? That may be offering them your email or, or your Zoom contact information, the hours that you're available, it may, be at, it may be listing the one, two, or three questions that you'd like to ask them. It might be setting a time limit for that experience. From a professional standpoint, you want to make it easy for us to, to want to connect. Why you're trying to connect and why it's, it's easy for us to do that, why it's beneficial to you. <clears throat> Oftentimes in these conversations, being thoughtful and creative can be very helpful. You may not have a specific plan. You may just be looking for information thinking about your bandwidth and is there anything of value that you can share with that person in that conversation before you exit? So can you offer your time or your research or your information or your network to that person in a certain way? So, instead, so you're actually creating value instead of asking for it. Um, these are, are ideas and examples Every one of you will have a different strategy, and this is where career services where can speak to the specifics of how you might want to craft these messages or who you might want to reach out to. In what's really interesting is from a um, in the sales perspective, they say it takes, I think it's seven to eight touches from when you first meet a new potential can, uh, client to when they sign on to your business. So what that's saying is that that's seven times you're reaching out and connecting them in some capacity before they make a purchasing decision. It's not exactly the same for people, but relationships are built on time and information and connection. So being thoughtful about those pieces and 
recognizing what you want to get out of those relationships can be very, very helpful too. Not every relationship is good. Some are just going to be, are going to be what they are. But here's the thing. If you find connections and communities you, that you, you want to sustain, make sure you do so. Is that if there's information about you or things that are happening, letting the people in your network know where you're at. There was a graduate student I'd worked with years ago who I had, um, who had asked for an informational interview and it went well. And every six months for about four years, she sent me an updated email about what she was doing and what she was working on, on and how things were going. It wasn't asking for anything. It was just letting me know where she was in, in this current state in her person, her life and her career. Now, that may not work for everybody, but I knew what she did professionally and what she was looking for. And if there were opportunities that I came across of interest by her being consistent in staying the relationship and sharing information, I was more apt to think of her if I saw opportunities in the market or in, for jobs and would share them with her. Those are the kind of things that, that can be helpful is that you know, a relationship is something sustained over time and it, it's a, a function of effort. They do yield roles and opportunities. But I'll go back one more time and just say, your particular networking style, your particular play, or, uh, way of engaging individuals is the right way. Being able to decide what that is and how we develop a, a, a plan of attack to connect with those folks and what they're looking for. Some relationships yield results in, in days and weeks and some yield over, over time. Um, but this is where being very thoughtful and the other side of this is, is really important is that be the person, if you can, that you would hope would benefit you. So there are going to be times, not maybe now, maybe in the future, where there will be professionals and students that are interested in what you do in your background. Making sure I think having those conversations with those students and be able to give back, those relationships oftentimes are, you know, are, are um, aren't unilateral and provide opportunities. So I think, you know, recognizing the fact there's just as much value in sharing your own insight. And I'll iterate it again, your background and experience is already valuable and we already know that. So making sure that you know that that's true and that when people seek out your expertise and understanding is that sharing your insights, whatever they are, can be transformative. We never ever know the exact thing that we say that's going to be the right thing to help somebody navigate the next piece. But I mean, being, being thoughtful and available, um, I think creates a lot of, of, of possibilities for, for careers. And, you know, that being said, you know, making sure, you know, staying in touch with your, your own classmates, your connections, making sure you still sustain relationships with professors and administrators who are, are actively looking out, you know, Tufts is a very thoughtful, connected community that wants to help others. And I think we're really excited about being able to do that. We can help you navigate those pieces. So I think having an effective and thoughtful job and internship strategy that's targeted to specific roles is critical. You do not have to have one specific role you're looking for. You could be looking for three different things in three different areas with three different areas. Just making sure that you recognize is that you're how you market yourself, how you brand yourself, how you showcase information to those audiences will be different. A resume and a cover letter for a healthcare consulting job, again, it's going to be very different from a curatorial role for a museum. Uh, design is going to be different, content is specific, expectation. Just a, remi you know, a reminder that there's no perfect resume format, there's no perfect CV format, there's no one specific cover letter um, opportunity. There's a lot of variety in spaces. We work with professionals all the time to make sure we understand what the best practices are. And we have a portfolio of, of tools and examples that you can use so you do not have to reinvent the wheel. We do not want you to be experts in resume and cover letter development. We want to be able to have you start the process and, and we can be there to help you re refine those pieces. We are here to be a resource for you moving forward. It is with the, some specific market and industry changes, being very thoughtful in this process will differentiate you from your competitors and create new opportunities. Making sure we have patience, making sure 
that especially in times like these that you sustain the communities that you're in and the connections that you have and the relationships that you build because this is hard and people are trying to figure these things out. So, you know, when you graduate or move on to the next piece is making sure you, you still connect to this because you have no idea what they're going to yield in the future. So, um, you know, I'm certainly grateful for the time to be here. Uh, I hope this information has been uh, useful and, and focused in a way that, that you can certainly act on, but at the very minimum recognizing that, you know, we are, we're making sure that we are understanding what, what's happening now so you can navigate it easier and faster and recognizing that you're not alone in this process. This was just a, an example of an outreach letter that I had mentioned before. Um, this document, um, along with the job search document, will certainly send so you have access to all these pieces and any of the links that are in here. I'll just mention briefly some job search and networking resources, resources that we have. One brand new resource that we have, um, which just went live about a week ago, is called Interstride. Interstride is uh, a company that is aggregating all F1 and H1B data, uh, I believe over the last 10 years or so. And it's a database of all the companies and organizations that have hired, um, hired H1, for H1B over the last 10 years. So you can sort it by company, you can sort it by directory, you can sort it by geography, you can judge it by job title. So for the, if, uh, if, you have, if you are an international student, we now have a resource which we think is, is best in breed for looking about what the types of organizations that have looked historically for, for hiring um, uh, students with a visa status. Um, I mentioned Handshake, I mentioned Going Global, which is a great resource for looking for domestic jobs, but also if you're looking for international opportunities. Um, we also have a, a list of a, a variety of other job search resources, remote jobs, how to build networks. One thing I, I, I didn't mention is that we have a networking resource called the Herd, which is, um, this is Tufts alumni networking, uh, mentoring network. So we are, uh, we have thousands of alumni in our directory right now. And it's a way to pair you up to have a, you know, to have a, a more formal relationship or mentoring relationship with an alumni. And I believe you can also, when you're alum, can become one as well. So this is one less obstacle for building a relationship and career planning. So they're, all the, the professionals are across a variety of backgrounds and expertise and experiences. So, and there's a link in this, uh, in this framework for you to, to check out. Um, I will say in a time of job search strategy and planning, anytime you can develop um, skill sets that are helpful and useful for in, in the marketplace. So if there are skills that we find that are hiring in, in times of challenge, um, we've listed a few here. LinkedIn Learning is a free resource for tough students and alumni where you can take courses on topic matters. And it'll actually, once you finish your courses, it'll actually give you a, uh, a check or certification. It will actually list them in your LinkedIn profile, which is actually a really nice way to brand your skill set. So if you complete an SQL workshop or you complete um, a negotiation one, it'll actually show up as a skill that you've acquired um, through that process. So a very good, useful resource. Um, another one I'll mention, which is about its interview prep, but it's actually great for, for Managing having virtual conversations is Big Interview, which is available to all uh, our tough students, which is a virtual interview preparation platform, but allows you to record your answers to particular questions and it, and you can get sample feedback or best or examples of best practices and also you can solicit feedback from other people. So as because this new medium of relationship building is no longer in person, we're having to be very thoughtful about how we connect and how we how we showcase our brand. This is a good way to, to make sure that happens. So um, these are the variety of resources. Um, I'm very, very grateful for the time we'll to, to talk and connect with you today. And I am happy to answer uh, any questions that you, that you may have. Um, Matt, we had a question in the chat about um, sharing the slideshow after this presentation. 
Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, so everyone who um, registered for the session, I'm happy to send that out via email. Um, if anybody who didn't register um, wants this, just feel free to email. Um, you can email me directly at Angela.foss at tufts.edu. Do you have, a, we have a few more minutes. Does anyone have any other questions that they wanted to? I can unmute you or you can um, share your questions via the chat. Um, the question is if this recording will be available. Um, yes, it will be, and we will share that as soon as I can um, get it off my computer and share it with all of you. <laughs> we had several participants, though, today, Matt. I think this was, was very helpful, and um, we really appreciate your time. Uh, if there's no other questions, um, I think that we can, can wrap this up. Um, you got a round of applause there, Matt, from Joy. <laughs> um, Thank you. So if there's anything else that you need, you know, feel free to reach out to us. We're here to help. Um, if we didn't answer any questions, um, we'll try to get some resources for you. Um, but I think this was super helpful and you covered a lot of ground and, and um, it's, a, it's a tough topic and uh, unprecedented time, as they say. So um, we really appreciate it. So uh, thanks, it's Matt. It's my pleasure. Yeah, and everyone, Career Services is open for regular business hours now and for throughout the summer. So we are doing all our points appointments virtually, um, but feel free to set up any time with on handshake for those pieces. And uh, and we're glad to have you. And we hope to be a resource to navigate such a, a crazy time. But um, thanks for having me.